Oh, um, are we doing these again? We are? Okay, but I'm not gonna read a script anymore, so, okay. Well, um, what do I have here today? Uh, let's see. I guess today we can talk a little bit about um, the Adrian helmet, the French helmet of the Great War. If you're gonna do any reenactment of the French army past like 1915, you're gonna need one of these. And this one is mine. A uh, reproduction uh, artillery Adrian helmet, the artillery badge, and uh, this is for my uh, tank crew impression. And they were issued artillery helmets. More on the removed brim later, and why tank crews did that. So before we can talk about this helmet itself, we should talk about the one that was before it, which. Do you really call a helmet? Mm, you can call it more like a cap. And that was the skull cap. And, well, my notes here says it was created due to the large amount of head injuries seen in the summer and fall of 1914. And that makes sense because before any head protection, the French army just wore the kepi, which is that small little funny hat. And uh, most head injuries caused by things like shrapnel, uh, fragmentation, whether it be from artillery or grenades, and just other flying debris in general, when, especially when artillery strikes the ground, it launches up, well, anything it hits, and you're going to need some head protection for that. Something needed to be done fast, so our hero of today, Quartermaster General Louis Adrian, he would propose in December 1914 the production of a simple protective cap called the skull cap, or more literally, the brain pan. Initially, uh, GQG, again, something here for what that is, was reluctant to approve since they thought that the war would be over before these skull caps would be distributed to the troops. General Adrian would soon convince them otherwise, and the GQG would approve production of this cap. Now, the uh, cap itself was stamped steel, about half a millimeter thick, with two holes drilled in the side for the soldiers to wrap the twine around and they can use that to fix it to their kit. Um, the cap itself was to be worn under the kepi, though some soldiers, what you can see in photographs, they would wear it above it, which would be more comfortable. And I don't have an example of the skull cap myself, but if you can imagine a literal steel bowl on the top of a poilu's head, I mean, that is what it looked like. Now, it did succeed in reducing head wounds, however, the armor thickness of just a half a millimeter thick meant that it offered only light protection against uh, incoming projectiles. However, the skull cap did do its job in the sense that the decreasing casualties from head wounds would be noticed by none other than General Joffre, who would become an advocate for an improved helmet by the end of February 1915. Now, General Joffre would order the production of an improved helmet, to which General Adrian would jump at the opportunity to design. The new helmet was to offer increased protection compared to the skull cap, and would be more comfortable. The new helmet should weigh as little as possible, but maintain strong durability, plus be able to be built in large numbers. So General Adrian's helmet would be based on pre-existing French helmet design theory such as the French cavalry helmets, the Renaissance era Bourguignon helmets, and of course, the helmets currently in use by the Paris Fire Brigade. And you will notice if you compare early Paris Fire Brigade helmets to the Adrian helmet, they look very similar. After some intensive prototype testing, General Adrian's design would be submitted for final approval by the end of April 1915 and production of the helmet would begin immediately afterwards. Like the skull cap, the Audrin helmet is made of steel, however it does boast thicker armor at 0.7 millimeters thick, and it weighs only 1.8 pounds. And that 
would mean it would be the lightest of the Great War helmets. Construction of the Adra helmet was primarily made up of four parts. You have the shell, front rim, neck guard, and the crest. Other small parts include your branch identifier badge, as well as the rivets located on the crest. You have four and then two on each side to fix the front rim and the neck guard together. Additionally, you have a moving loop hinge here to fix your chin strap to the helmet. Now the helmet liner, as you can see here, well, the first version was made of sheepskin. However, this would be replaced by a better quality goat skin. The first model liner was cut from one piece consisting of seven teeth with a copper eyelet to take the drawstring. The leather was blackened and varnished. In fall 1915, a second model would appear made of two pieces sewn together. This is the one I have. The leather was also left in its natural color. You will note that it also only has six teeth compared to the first version seven. As you can see, the eyelets are on each tooth and that is for the drawstring, which is used to adjust the helmet on your head. This liner would be two-piece construction compared to the first version one piece. And these two pieces would be the large leather ring around your head and then the teeth. So inside the liner, there would be a piece of red or blue wool. And this was from recycled material from other production lines. And this wool would be the material used to connect the liner to the shell of the Adron helmet. And the method here used is you have on the shell two prongs on each side of the helmet. These prongs would face outward, like such. And what you were supposed to do is you take your liner, the wool of the liner, and you stab the wool onto these metal prongs, and that would fix the helmet liner to your shell. Another thing about the liner is the method used to fix the liner to the helmet would create these little air gaps between each of the prongs, and that would also create a bit of head wobble. So the method they used to solve this issue would be the addition of four corrugated metal spacers. And these spacers would be fixed to each side of the helmet, also using the prongs like the liner. And what these spacers did was remove some of that air gap between the shell and the liner, reducing wobble. Now for the chin strap, much like the helmet liner, these would originally be sheepskin, but would be replaced by goatskin. The first version, like the liner once again, was also blackened, however the second version chin strap, which is the one I have, was left in a natural brown color. So the strap thickness is 2 millimeters, and it is adjusted by a black lacquered buckle here, and it uses a very simple adjustment method. And that method is a simple, just leather basic adjustment system. If you look at photos of Poyu at the time period, you will note that for the majority of them, this double-sided piece of leather would almost always be on the right side of the helmet. So when you are mounting your chin strap to your helmet, ensure that you are doing the most common route and fix this double-sided piece of leather from the chin strap onto the right side of your helmet. Speaking of the methods used to fix this chin strap on the helmet, the method here of securing the chin strap is the use of a brass rivet. Now, there would be non-regulation copper rivets, which would be seen. However, this is the regulation brass rivet. So again, another close-up of the buckle. See here? Mine's a little scratched up. Happens. Once these helmets were received by the troops, there would be an immediate decrease in the number and severity of head wounds. 
these helmets are great. They did the job very well. And I will note that these helmets were not intended to be bulletproof. Their main goal was to stop medium to light projectiles, as well as the concussive force of overhead blasts, which we'll get to later. So originally, the color of the helmets were an issue. They would be released from the factory in a glossy blue color, and this would create a lot of shine in the sun. And the initial stopgap response to this was to just create a canvas helmet cover, and these would be distributed beginning November 1915. Uh, they would soon be banned, along with putting mud on your helmet to get rid of that gloss, in October 15th, 1916. Because by then, in June 1916, there was a less glossy finish done to the helmet. And the finalized color would be something like this, like a matte blue-gray. This is pretty dang accurate to the color one would see in a 1916. If you are reenacting a 1915 to like early 1916 you, you do want to have the lighter glossy color on your helmet. So talking a little bit about the Audrin helmet in the context of my impression, which is a Great War French tank crewman. Tank crews, like the standard infantry and everyone in the French army, required a helmet. So the French tank corps were considered to be artillery in the Great War, so they would be issued the artillery badge for the Adrian helmet, and this would be the French grenade over two crossed cannons, compared to, let's say, the Poilu standard line infantry would just be the flaming grenade. So they would be issued standard artillery helmets, and that would include the front brim. However, the tankist would find out that when operating in the tank, trying to get a good sight picture on the 5mm wide vision slits with a full front brim would be very difficult, as it did force your head to be farther back to the armor plate. So many crews would decide to cut off the front brim and fold over the sharp edge, or cover the sharp edge in leather or cloth padding. In my case, I did choose to use leather padding. And once they cut off the front brim, they got a much closer sight picture to the tank's vision slits. I will add on to this in regards to Great War French tanks. That would be 5mm wide vision slits directly on the armor, no bullet resistant glass. It was direct vision. Which is why they would be issued these. These tank crew modifications would begin to be seen in late 1917, and they would become widespread by late 1918. It spread naturally among the tank crews and the tank regiments, and it was left unrestricted because the GQG did see the effectiveness of simply removing the front brim. And the Tonkist were given the initiative to optimize their uniforms as it was a new branch. And just a little close up here of the removed front brim and the leather padding. You can see here. So, General Astien, head of the Artillery Speciale, French Tank Corps, he would take note of this helmet modification on April 15th, 1918, and he would notify General Catan of what was happening. General Astien did like what he was seeing with these modified helmets, so the modified helmets would lead to the development of a specialized tank helmet, which would begin distribution in 1919. From essentially 1917 all the way to 1940, you can see a very strong lineage from this helmet to the 1940 tank helmet. And a little bit more on the crest seen on Adrian helmets. This was not just done for decoration, it had the purpose of deflecting overhead blasts and projectiles. You will notice even modern day construction worker helmets and modern day firefighter helmets still have one or even two prominent crests on the top of their helmet. And much like the crests on the Adrian helmet, those are for stopping overhead projectiles from hitting directly on the head. They would strike the crest first and then that angle of the crest would keep it away from the top of the head. 
Now this effect would be proven by a study in 2020 that actually found out that the Adrian helmet still outperforms even modern day helmets such as the ACH in terms of deflecting overhead blasts away from the wearer's head. And I will add on to that, it did also surpass the British and American helmet as well as the Stahlhelm thanks to this crest. Again, in terms of deflecting overhead blasts. I believe that is what this helmet should be known for, was primarily its effectiveness at deflecting stuff like artillery concussion away from the user's head. So I guess, in that lens, if you ever find yourself transported back to the Great War and you have to dodge overhead artillery blasts, you may have access to the best ballistic modern day helmets, but you will also have access to millions of these steel Audra helmets. And I guess in that case, stopping overhead artillery blasts, you may want to consider picking up one of these. So to end this video, for anyone who is looking to do a Great War Tonkist impression, I recommend a reproduction Adrian helmet. And that is because you may want to have the option to cut off the front brim. So in my case, this is a reproduction. I did cut off the front brim, I did install the leather padding, much like the Tonkis would have done in the past. And since I do suggest that you get a reproduction Audrey helmet for a Great War Tonkis impression, I will add that reproduction helmets, they tend to have a very default liner and a very basic chin strap, so you will have to replace that with another reproduction set that is more accurate to the original. Another thing for a Great War Tonkist impression is to stick with the artillery helmet badge as this is what they would primarily have in the vast, vast majority of Tonkist. In general, if you're going to do a historical impression, you want to stick with what was common and, well, the artillery badge was what was common for the Tonkist of the Great War. So just to recap, if you're looking to do a Great War Tonkist impression, you're going to want a reproduction artillery Adrian helmet just so you can have the option to cut off the front brim should you notice that you can't really see outside your tank. I would also recommend the second model of chin strap and the second model of helmet liner as again that would be the most common for the tankist at the time as well as the option to have the corrugated spacers. And for a proper fitting, I would first suggest to put a spacer at the front of your helmet. If you still notice any wobble, remove that. Get the two larger ones, put them on the side. If you still notice wobble, do two on the side, one in the front. If you still got wobble there, do all of them. Two on the side, two in the front and the back. Should you choose to remove your front brim as a tonkist, I would suggest you stop before you hit the two rivets on the side of the helmet as if you take a look at original Great War Tonkist modified helmets, they tended to stop the cut before these two rivets. And since you have a reproduction helmet, don't worry if you damage it or scratch it up. Mine has been in general use for about three years and it does have a bit of scratching. Nothing too serious, but don't be afraid to give your helmet some character and should you bump into anything, well, that's the helmet doing its job. And just uh, make sure to adjust the drawstring and the liner to where you want your helmet to sit on the top of your head. You want it to look something a little bit like this. So as a Great War Tankis from the Faba 1 Regiment d'Artillerie Speciale, that is really all I have in regards to our special modified helmets. If you are looking to do a Great War Tankist impression, I wish you good fortune, and should you do your helmet right, you will be left with a very good looking reproduction of the modified Audrian helmet for tank use. So uh, I hope you found this helpful, and I'm just going to get back to doing what I was doing. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 <laugh